Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Q&As. And fortunately, now that the channel rights have been restored, I've won my copyright claim, I can do this in one big video again. This week I've cut it down to only one PED related question, because I only saw one worth asking. I'm going to go into a political and personal question at the end. So for people who aren't interested in those things, you can cut out once I get to those, and um, let's just take it from there. So first question. Hey Jason, you have mentioned before that multivitamin supplements are not proven to work, yet you recommend supplementing with D3 for people who don't stay in the sunlight. Would you recommend supplementing the D3 work, but supplementing with other vitamins wouldn't? Could you please elaborate? Thanks. All right, I've answered this like five times in individual videos. I, I really don't understand what the confusion is. So let me clarify for people so they understand what I'm talking about. Multivitamins fall into a category of containing every single vitamin and mineral in them. It's a big collage of them from different sources. Vitamins are a very, very broad term. A vitamin is anything that the body needs for you to put into it nutritionally that is not a mineral, that doesn't have calories, and that it can't necessarily produce on its own. That's what a vitamin is. They contain all different structures of things, everything from steroid hormones to other types of uh, compounds, anything that's not a mineral. So it's a wide encompassing type of things. You could look at different vitamins through a microscope or look at their chemical structures and they're not even in the same category of things chemically. It's a whole host of things. Vitamin D3 is an individual vitamin. It's actually a steroid hormone that we know is orally absorbable. We know that it gets in the bloodstream and we know the body metabolizes it just fine when taken orally. With multivitamins, because the data is so inconclusive and there's such a debate among it, we don't know if the body absorbs all the stuff in it. So it's possible to be taking a multivitamin and to get toxic doses of certain things. It's possible for you to not absorb some of those vitamins at all because they're not found in the natural matrix or plant matrix or food matrix. They're found in the nature and so your body doesn't utilize it and absorb it right because you're not getting them in the right ratios of something else. And that's generally how we absorb that vitamin. They're just a collage of random stuff thrown together. And because of that, you can't say for certain if they work. The, the data has been inconclusive and even the top researchers in the world are all split between three ideas. Some think that they work and they do fine, they're helpful. Some think that they're useless and you don't really absorb all of it correctly due to the reasons I explained. And others, and again, this makes up almost a third of them, think that they're actually dangerous for you and harmful for your health. That's the top minds in science studying this or, or debating those three points and there's still no conclusion as to which of those three is right because you're dealing with a whole matrix of different things of 30 different things thrown together in one pill hoping it will work and just hammering every angle whereas in the d3 we know because we've studied it when you take it individually by itself it absorbs fine, metabolizes fine, you see positive benefits, your body is able to use it because we've been able to isolate it and study it when people take just that one specific vitamin. With the multivitamin, there's no guarantee of that and even then the answer might be all three of those things depending on which brand you take and how it's assembled and put together. There could actually be individual multivitamin brands and makes and, and uh, types that fall into any of those three categories. There could be ones that fall into all three. So it might turn out that all three types of researchers and scientists are correct. Just depends on which multivitamin you grab. So it's a big crapshoot, and that's what we're saying. So hopefully that clarifies that. All right, next question. Hey Jason, is it a good idea to bulk for a week and then cut for a week to recomp? No, absolutely not. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Currently slow cutting to a lower weight class in uh, BJJ, and once I'm there, I want to build maximum strength while staying at my fight weight. BJJ comp weigh-ins on uh, the day, so no big water cuts. No, you're, you're not going to be able to program any sort of training around that. When I, I gave before, I recommended that to stay leaner, people bulk, clean bulk slowly for eight weeks and then recomp for four weeks. Recomping, if you're doing it week to week at a time and you're bulking then cutting, all you're doing is gaining water weight and losing water weight. You're not going to be able to program any of your progression or training because you're going to be gaining muscle and fat one week, losing muscle and fat the next. There's no way you're going to be able to program and periodize your training correctly to gain muscle and progressive overload because you're not giving yourself enough time. At the minimum, the bare minimum, you should cut stuff would be, and I wouldn't even recommend this, but if you really wanted to be extreme, the absolute most effective extreme would be three weeks of each and then periodize oh. your training around it. So 
I would still think that would be a bad idea. It wouldn't be efficient, but you would at least see some progress if you did it in three week blocks because it gives you three weeks to hit progressive overload and make gains on, and then three weeks to cut, and then three weeks to try to regain the muscle you lost and guarantee you lose it uh, during the next bulk again. Uh, you could do it that way. That would be, if you wanted to break it up week to week, that would be the, the smallest, absolute smallest blocks I would put it in, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. The best recomp methods that work on a weekly recomp are going to be um, running days, several days, up to five or six days of a calorie deficit followed by a refeed at the end where you overfeed uh, for, for like one day or two days. That would be your most effective way to recomp at the same weight if you want to do it on a weekly basis instead of in blocks. All right, next question. Jason, how come there are so many guys who look extremely scrawny and tiny but can move heavy weight on the big three and some guys are extremely huge and fat and they do the same? Uh, example being powerlifters versus Olympic lifters. I see all these Olympic weightlifters and they look so tiny and you wouldn't even really think they lift, but they squat upwards of 500 pounds on their frames uh, that make even bigger powerlifters turn heads. The thing is, is that there's not that many guys. That's like saying, why are there so many billionaires in the world? I see them on TV and stuff all the time. Donald Trump and Bill Gates and all these people. But these lifters who you're describing are as rare as billionaires. It's because they, they're doing something so exceptional because they're well-seen athletes out there. They get publicity and you see them. I promise you that these people are literally one in a million lifters. These people are genetic freaks. The Richard Hawthorns and even the Olympic lifters who are 140 pounds out there and they squat 500 pounds are all without a belt. These people are the genetic extreme outliers. They are genetic freaks. And the only reason you see so many of them is because they get so highlighted. Again, it's like saying statistically, why does there seem to be so many billionaires in the world? I see one all the time on TV when I watch stuff or when I read Forbes magazine because you're looking at a media that's specifically looking at these things. They're actually extremely rare and it comes down to uh, genetics. Only a tiny fraction of people genetically have the ability to do that. And those people are destined to be world champion uh, record holding power lifters in their class in the lighter weight classes or be top level Olympic lifters and compete in the Olympics. They're the genetic elite for strength to weight ratios. They're extremely rare. And what you're looking at, you're probably thinking, well, there's a couple hundred of them out there in the world, so there's tons of them. Yeah, but there's over 7 billion people. These people are rare. Sorry, guys, we're going to have to deal with dogs today. I Nothing I can do about it. They're not going to quit barking. All right, next question. Jason, please educate us on this milk conspiracy. Every day I'm hearing about hormones, poisons, inflammation, and all these reasons why I'm poisoning my body by drinking cow's milk. People are promoting alternatives, coconut, uh, almond, cashew, etc. I don't know what popular Netflix documentary is sparking up all this uh, conspiracy, but it's driving me nuts. Surely cow's milk is okay, right? Can you do a video? I've covered this countless times, and I said the same thing when I was actually a vegan a while back, which I gave it a try for a while, and a lot of people remember that, and a lot of people are still upset that I flip-flopped, that I went from uh, doing ketogenic diets to trying veganism for a while and going back to ketogenic diets. Well, you know what? you got to be open to new things. I think veganism is absurd after having tried. I think it's literally insane. Now, what I said when I was a vegan is that this stuff wasn't true. This is mostly nonsense. It's been studied heavily. If you tolerate milk genetically, milk is probably fine. If you don't tolerate milk genetically, you should probably avoid it, meaning if you're lactose intolerant. And over, over half of the world population is lactose intolerant, so they shouldn't be consuming milk. That's your real concern. This other stuff is mostly nonsense. It's been way overhyped. This is, again, vegan propaganda, far-left propaganda. This is political-based propaganda. It's not necessarily true, but people who are lactose intolerant, which make up over 50% of the world, should be concerned about milk, or people who have a casein allergy or people who like the enzyme to develop uh, to digest casein and it converts into caseomorphins and has an opiate like effect in their brain should probably avoid it there's different tests and things you can do for this there's medical issues that will arise for you from drinking milk so this should be a concern for you if you just genetically don't tolerate it but if you do and you want to drink milk then by all means do so i'm personally lactose intolerant i don't drink it the only way I would drink milk again is um, if I had enemies I, and I didn't have a firearm and I needed to devastate my enemies and get locked in a room with them. I'd drink some milk and I'd kill everybody in the room with my horrific gas because it's pretty bad. Like my lactose intolerance is pretty obvious that I developed it as an adult. All right. Next question. 
Chase and I am six months into my bulk and have gotten what is medically known as fat as hell around the 20 to 25 percent mark. However, in these six months, I have gained loads of strength and have stayed uh, still somewhat fit due to less cardio two to three times a week. My question is, what should I now do to help my goals of strength and health work into a slow recomp phase where I can still gain muscle and strength or stay true to the bulk for the whole year cycle and do a true cut after many things? I can't tell you what are you comfortable with. If you feel like you're getting too fat and it sounds like six months into a bulk, you probably are. If you're already up in the 20 to 25 percent range and you feel fat and it's bothering you and you feel it's unhealthy, you need to end your bulk. As I've said before, you guys remember the other thing I said about the eight week and four week is probably a, a better method for people who are concerned about body fat. Well, bulking up to six months, you're probably gaining more fat than muscle now at this point. So maybe you should go do on a cut. It doesn't have to be a long cut. Cut four weeks, six weeks, and then go back to your bulk if you want. But you're at a point now to where if you feel you're too fat, you're going to just gain more fat than muscle at this point. So you're going to get an even higher body fat percentage if you continue this for the whole year. You're probably going to hit 30% body fat. So it comes down to your personal choice. Are you comfortable doing that? And if you're not, then it's time to go ahead and do a cut, get a bit leaner, and then go back into your bulk. And realize that you've probably milked out what you're going to get from a true dirty bulk at this point. You need to bulk a little cleaner from now on. All right, next question. Just found out I have a weak core. I wasn't doing any direct core at all as I thought doing squats and deadlifts alone would be enough, but now my core is a limiting factor in both squats and deadlifts. Should I do standing cable crunches or weighted planks or maybe both? And if I do both, um, do I do them in one session or alternate every session? What about the ab wheel? And no, I mean a legit ab wheel. Or any other exercises that you would recommend? I don't know where to start. All right, uh, you guys have seen me do standing crunches in videos. In fact, I think recently in a workout video in my training playlist, I did standing crunches with bands. Probably one of the best exercises you can do for your core in the squat and the deadlift is going to be standing crunches. Do them every workout. Do them with bands like that. If you don't have bands, cables will work, but bands are fantastic. And then weighted planks. Weighted planks are also a fantastic core exercise. You guys have seen me do those on video when I was back in the UK when I was training more with a belt so that I would get extra core work in uh, to help compensate for that. And yes, you can do them every session if you want. You could even do weighted planks on your various non-training days or do them at home if you want to, or you can do them right after your other core work. But standing crunches with bands, weighted planks, and you should be good to go on your core, on your squat, and your deadlift. And yes, they can very much be a limiting factor. The guys who think that the squat and the deadlift are probably all you need for your core, well, for some guys that might be true, and for a lot guys it'll end up being your weak link so you will need to do extra core work and you've assessed that it's your weak link so get on it all right next question and i trimmed this one down it might seem a little disjointed but this question was just too long for me to read the whole thing and it's still excessively long guys don't write me the great american novel please it's just try to word things to where i can at least trim a full paragraph out of the middle and it still be a cohesive question it would help a lot if you want me to pick your longer ones all right so his trim down question the best i could what's up jason i'd like to sort out a medical question i'm a lifetime natural Every time I go to the doctor, he seems to always be running a bunch of tests on me and asking me and my girlfriend if I'm on supplements. Recently, he called me back and told me that my creatine levels are elevated and that my liver or something may be getting affected by the supplements I'm using. I keep telling him I only use plain creatine and whey protein. He asked me to stop taking that and ran another test. I brushed him off continuing my creatine and whey protein, which was stupid as fuck, by the way. Your doctor tells you to come off something, something come off of it. And let me continue here. He never got back to me with the results, so I called him. He stated that everything got better the, than last time, even my creatine levels, but they were still high. I asked what was normal. He said 400 and that mine is 600. My question is, should I be worried or is it something minimal? My doctor is just a regular physician and also seems to lack a lot of knowledge about proper nutrition and weight lifting. Just because he lacks proper uh, knowledge of lifting a weight nutrition doesn't mean that he can't read your blood work results and tell that you are damaging yourself or endangering yourself. I don't even personally think, in spite of a lot of data, that creatine actually works. But if it does work, it's going to produce such a minimal gain for the non-novice lifter that if your doctor is telling you that taking this creatine might be harming your health and you're saying, but I don't want to lose that extra ounce of muscle I'm going to gain for a year, fuck my liver, then you're probably a really stupid person. Stop and think about that for a minute. It's not like you're using drugs here that are going to give you significant results. Supplements are never going to give you significant amounts of gains. It's going to be 
microscopic in a best case scenario. If your doctor is telling you you might be at risk of har harming your liver from taking this due to the blood work that he pulled, if you don't immediately come off of it, that's called people who win the Darwin Award. Seriously, dude, if the doctor tells you to come off the fucking creatine, come off the creatine. It's not even going to help you that much in the best case scenario. It's not worth dying for. I'm really shocked at this. I'm not trying to be a dick, but I'm really shocked at this, at this question. And I don't know what else to say other than come off the fucking creatine. Seriously, guys, this is why people think lifters are dumb. This is why you, we get these stereotypes. All right, enough of my rant. Next question. Jason, what is your opinion on hot Epsom salt bass recovery uh, for one after heavy weight training sessions and two after a competitive strength endurance sports game soccer? Also, uh, would you recommend is the best way to recover from the two events? Thanks. Guys, there's a lot about recovery. I'm not going to cover all that in a Q&A, but as far as hot Epsom salt bass, I think they're fantastic for recovery. If you're sore from training and feeling beat up and everything, getting in a hot Epsom salt bath is fantastic. We could argue as to whether how much physical recovery the Epsom salt and everything gives, but you know what? It does seem to give recovery, and even if there's a placebo effect there, it still relaxes you. Relaxing you brings down stress levels, brings down cortisol levels, will improve recovery, but all of that hot water will actually improve circulation to your muscles and improve circulation generally improves recovery so i think it's a fantastic way to recover uh, and if you feel like it's helping you recover then by all means continue to do so it's not like it's costing you a lot of money and it's relaxing and it feels good so do it absolutely all right next question and this is the last of the normal questions so let's knock this one out hey jason i'm leaving for basic training in a few days uh, i received a medical waiver for my ac joint degeneration but I'm still worried about further injuring myself in basic. I need advice like desperately. I don't want to go through all the trouble just to be kicked out. And you're knowledgeable as hell. LOL, any words of wisdom? Well, let's go with just words of wisdom here rather than try to give medical advice because your medical doctor says he thinks you're okay. Well, if the medical doctor thinks you're okay, then you really want to do this, then go for it. And Because what I would tell you is, if you really want to join the military and that's important to you, then you, I'm going to say it probably is because you went through the trouble to get medical clearance for a medical issue because you really want to go in. You're worried about not making it through basic, but you know what? The doctor thinks you're probably going to be okay. You might not be. You might still be removed from basic. That happened to a really good friend of mine many years ago. He wanted to be an army ranger so bad. He had a knee issue. His knee swelled up and it became a problem and they gave him a medical discharge. He didn't get to finish basic. But you know what? He at least gave it the effort because it was important enough to him to try and his medical issue stopped him. But maybe your medical issues won't stop you again odds are in your favor if the doctor thinks it's okay so get in there if it's important to you give it a hundred percent and if you have an issue they're not going to injure you too bad when they start seeing problems and basic with a medical issue they're going to watch you because of this medical issue you've had and if they start seeing problems yeah they might remove you so you're probably not going to really get hurt and again if you were overly concerned about getting hurt or too much high risk you probably wouldn't have joined the military anyway so i'm going to assume it's in your personality that you're willing to take certain risks for things that you believe in so the risk there is going to be minimal but if that does happen at least you will know that you attempted to do the thing that you wanted to do and you gave it 100% and you'll be able to look at yourself and respect after doing that. And you know what? If it doesn't become a problem, and again, the doctor thinks it won't, then everything's going to be okay. You're going to go in, you're going to do the thing that you want to do, that you believe in, and you're going to feel like a better person for it. So I say go for it uh, and just do it. Don't worry about it at this point. Worrying about it is the worst thing you can do. You just need to go in, complete basic, and do the best that you can. And best of luck to you there. All right, next question is going to be my PED question of the week. I haven't even decided how I want to answer this one, but let me read it anyways. PED related question. Could you address uh, main arguments for cycling steroids for recreational users, such as letting your body recover and giving some rest from drugs, especially internal organs, cardiovascular and endocrinological system, permanent shutdown of testicles, etc.? I know you think cycling is stupid, so it would be nice to hear what your thoughts are on that. P.S. George Lehman recently has made a video on steroids for noobs and seems to have a similar take on it as you do. Yeah, that's the only logical approach. The, again, cycling is stupid. So here's my question. If you're not willing to take the risks of permanent shutdown and having to go on TRT sooner than you might have, you don't need to be using gear at all. You shouldn't be there. A recreational steroid user is a stupid idea. 
it is. It's really stupid. I don't understand the logic behind it of you want to make gains and then lose most of your gains so that you're, you keep producing sperm or your testicles keep working the way that you want them to work. But there's still a chance that they won't no matter what because PCT isn't certain and then repeat the process, make gains, lose 90% of your gains or two thirds of your gains from it and just keep repeating the process. And eventually you still don't come back online and you still go on TRT, but you suffer this loss of all your gains back and forth and the psychological effects of PCT, they're enormous. They have very negative uh, effects on your psychology. It doesn't make any sense at all. So I don't really understand why you would need me to cover this again. This is something that is a I don't believe in. I think it's a really bad idea of the whole cycling on and off in the PCT thing. And as far as organs and uh, organ risks, well, if you don't want organ risks and don't use drugs that risk your organs, stick to the ones that don't elevate liver enzymes. Stick to the ones that don't cause toxicity. I mean, that's just a selection of, you know, pick your poison. If those are concerns, then don't put the things into your body that give the risk that you don't want to suffer. It's pretty straightforward here. And I'm glad that George uh, holds the same stance that I do. I think every reasonable person on this topic is going to pick that stance and only really stupid people are going to advocate the whole cycling thing and the PCT thing. It's completely illogical and it makes no sense. So again, I'm glad to hear that George uh, Lehman agrees there. All right, next question and last question of the week. Uh, what are your thoughts on donating to charity? Does it work or just uh, funding corrupt governments and charity workers? I really can't say around the world, but I do know in the U.S. what I would recommend you do Anytime you're going to donate to a charity, make sure that it's a worthwhile charity. Make sure that they're not giving just tons of money to run a business and, and eight or ten cents on the dollar actually goes to help people. Uh, I'm a big fan of charity in general because I don't believe, I'm a, I'm a true fiscal conservative. I believe in free markets. I don't believe in using government to fix problems that you don't have to. So I'm a big fan of charities and I personally would much rather see charities handle all of our welfare in the country and almost pretty much chop the welfare system down because we know that government bureaucracy wastes money. It is extremely inefficient. The free market generally does a better job of being efficient with money in those different charities. If they were running all of our food, food banks, food services, housing services for the impoverished, they would be competing with each other to do a, a more effective job in a lot of ways, depending on how those things operate. And uh, again, because they're going to get limited donations, they're going to make better use of the money. Governments tend to just waste money doing it and they'll just pull more from their budget and pull more taxes to do it. And our welfare system is a, a joke in the U.S. It's a complete mess. I would much rather see us build upon the idea that corporations and people like tax breaks. So I would much rather see all of that stuff be run by private charities, no taxation go toward it, towards it, cut all taxes down, and instead to make sure the same amount of funding goes to it, start giving corporations and people who donate to any of these charities, instead of the single tax credit that we give now, match them dollar for dollar, give them double the money. If they donate to any of these worthwhile charities, every thousand dollars that they donate, give them a $2,000 tax break. If it happens to be one directly related to food, or shelter for the impoverished, even better, give them a triple tax credit. Give them $3 on the dollar as far as their tax reductions. You do that and I promise you that corporations will donate billions of dollars to these just to get the tax breaks because it will help them lower their taxes enough that it will be financially worthwhile for them to do so and quit wasting tax dollars doing this stuff. Because at the end of the day, and it might make me sound like a bad person, but I believe in fiscal conservatism and I believe in social Darwinism, and if these people, and I don't believe that we have an absolute obligation to help everyone who's impoverished outside of our own personal choices for charity. So what you do, you make charity beneficial for people and they'll be far more willing to donate to charities, encourage donations and encourage charities to help with all of these problems rather than steal the money from the taxpayer and force them to help people that they may not want to help and may not have any desire to help. That's just called theft and that should be legal. Just my personal opinion there on politics. So yeah, I am kind of a true right winger and a true fiscal conservative. And for the record, people are like, weren't you on welfare? And no, I don't know where people get that idea from. No, I didn't get benefits when I was in the UK. I had to fight when I was sick and in bed to try to get a little bit of welfare. And to be honest, I was really too sick to make it down to the government offices effectively enough to really get it. And I didn't really get much of anything at all while I was in bed sick. I kind of just had to hustle and do my own thing to survive and sell assets that I had. And I wrote papers for college students 
while laying in my bed sick to help them cheat and got paid for it so that I could actually survive at that time. That's how I actually physically survived. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.